Well, this is an incredible joy to be here at Focus on the Family. I love Focus on the Family. I've been on the show with um, Jim Daly, and it was an incredible joy. But we are here to talk about listening and how that impacts your leadership. You know, it's been said that there are two kinds of people in the world. The first enters a room and says, here I am. The second enters a room and says, there you are. This was brought home to my husband and I when we were first married. My husband was the pastor of a very small church. It was a country church. And one Thursday, he received a phone call from a very well-known speaker who said, I'm going to be in your area, and I would like to come speak at your church. Well, Steve and I were about 22 at the time, and Steve was very excited. So he called all the radio stations, you know, the whole shebang for this famous speaker to speak at our church. And the gentleman came, and we were going to have him and his wife for dinner at our house after. And because I was newly married and a little nervous about all this, I invited an older friend who knew how to cook better than I did, and said, will you come and help me with this? And she brought her husband. Well, as they sat in the living room getting ready for dinner, this famous speaker kept saying, and as you know, I'm going to be debating Madeline Mary O'Hare. And as you know, I'm going to be at Madison Square Garden. And as you know, and he kept going on like this. We got to the dinner table and he continued. My husband prayed for the food, and this gentleman just kept saying, as you know, I'm going to be in this big church and that big church. Well, our friend's husband had had enough. <laughs> so he looked this speaker right in the eye, and he said, you know what? I never even heard of you before today. I, have, I didn't even know your name. The, the famous speaker's wife was very upset. She pounded the table and said, how dare you speak to my husband like that? And then this speaker said, well, let's take this out on the porch and settle it. And my husband was like, there's going to be a fist fight. At that point, I got up to make more coffee. <laughs> they went out on the porch. And this friend said to this famous speaker, you know, you came in here and you talked all about yourself. You kept assuming we all knew who you were. You never asked me even one question about who I was or my family. And to the speaker's credit, he apologized. We got through dinner, and I think my husband and I both went to bed. We were so exhausted. But you know, that illustrates the point that as a leader, you need to enter the room and say, there you are. Because how you listen is going to make or break your leadership. And so this morning, I want to give you five principles that are going to help you increase your ability to listen. And afterwards, there is a handout on the table that you can take with you and take a little quiz to see how you're doing in the listening realm and a few reflective questions. You know, we all follow <clears throat> the leader Jesus. And Jesus once said, be careful, consider carefully how you listen. And those are good words for us. The first principle I want to give you today is to prioritize connection over direction. As leaders, we give a lot of direction to people, don't we? You know, I need you to have this done by such and such a date. I need you to have this done by such and such a date. But if people aren't feeling connected to you, they're not going to be willing to follow you. It, it's been interesting since the Surgeon General's report came out at the beginning of this year about the new epidemic of loneliness in our culture. It's been reported that one out of every two adults here in America is struggling with loneliness. What that tells me is that there are people on your team 
who are struggling with loneliness. They want to feel connected. Gallup <clears throat> conducted a survey on workplace friendships and happiness. And the results showed us that most people feel happier at work if they have one close friend. Isn't that interesting? Years ago, we were all taught, you don't have to be friends with the people at work. Well, that's not true, because you need to be connected to your teams. This study really shows the need for listening leaders more than ever. And so I want to suggest to you that as you prioritize connection, you build a culture of connection with your team. And one of the ways you do this is by deep waters. But one who has insight draws them out. We need to learn how to have the art of asking questions so that our people feel connected. When you ask a question, you are inviting that other person into a conversation with you. As you continue to ask them questions, you're telling them, this conversation is interesting to me, and I want to continue it. People will automatically feel affirmed by that. In, in two of the books on listening, there's lists of 50 questions you can ask people, because we've got to recover the art of conversation on our teams. When our daughter graduated from college, her first job was at a financial company. And she was a little nervous. She was a bookkeeper, which she's not doing that now. But so she got hired, and um, her boss said to her, OK, in the first two weeks on the job, I want you to conduct a 15-minute interview with every person in the company. I don't want you to worry about bookkeeping at all. And I, I think about that, and I think that's brilliant. A study that I read said that if a person is just hired in a company, if you provide that person a buddy, somebody that's going to walk them through the ropes of adjusting to the company, to your team, they're going to have far more success. Why? Because they feel connected. Everybody has a story, and they're dying to share it with you. You know, you may not know the stories of the people on your team, but I can tell you a few things about them. Some of them are struggling with anxiety. Anxiety is now at an all-time high, especially since the pandemic. Some of them are struggling in their marriages. And they may be afraid to tell you that, because after all, you're focused on the family. Some of them are struggling with their kids. How well are you leading them? Do you invite them to talk to you? Do they feel safe enough to come to you and tell you what's really going on in their lives? Several years ago, My husband and I were on a plane, and um, we're kind of weird in this way. So I like the aisle seat, and he likes the window seat. And I have claustrophobia, so I can't sit in the middle seat. So sometimes when we get on a plane, he's on the window, I'm on the aisle, and he winks at me, and then he puts in his headphones and checks out for the rest of the flight. And so on this particular flight, he did that. Well, a woman came and sat down in between us. She didn't know we were married. You know, we didn't want to make her feel awkward. So she sat down, and I was really dying to read my book. But I asked her how she was. And from that moment on, she talked nonstop. She told me about where she was going. She told me about her three divorces. She told me about her second husband, who was apparently, in her perspective, a jerk. She told me about the people she was going to meet with. She told me about a new diet she was on. She ordered a glass of wine and then told me she was trying to cut back on wine. And <laughs> by the time I got off that plane, I even know how much this lady weighed, because she had told me everything. What was interesting is when we got off the plane, she turned to me and she said, thank you for such a wonderful conversation. 
And I thought to myself, well, it was really more of a monologue. And my husband said to me, my word, Becky, what happened there? She just like talked nonstop to you. He said, I think you have an invisible sign on your forehead that says, talk to me. <laughs> and maybe I do, I don't know. But if I do, I want to leave it there. Because what I'm learning is that even on a plane ride, people are dying to feel hurt. They are dying to feel hurt. The second, the second principle on how to become a better listener is to ask for feedback. Now, I know that can feel a little daunting. But the thing is, as leaders, we've got to raise our self-awareness. Again, the psalmist says, who can discern their hidden faults? So you may think you're doing a great job at listening. I dare you to ask the people closest to you, maybe your spouse, your adult kids. Now, to warn you, if you ask your adult kids, expect a very honest answer. I remember when our oldest daughter had graduated college, and um, I really thought I was a good listener, you know. And I said to her, well, honey, you know, how well do you think I listen? And I kind of stood back waiting for the rave reviews. And there was a long pause. And then she said, well, sometimes you listen well. She said, you interrupt me a lot. You give a lot of advice. And I don't want advice. I want you to give me empathy. And she said, sometimes you're distracted. You're, you've got stuff on your mind. And sometimes you try to dive in with your story so that I'll relate better. I remember going to bed that night thinking, well, that didn't go well. You know, because like you, I want to be a great listener. But what I've learned is that it's a growth curve. You have to move gradually to become a better listener. It can be productive to ask the people on your team, how did I come across in that meeting? I remember when I first became a leader, I was young. And my husband wanted me to direct women's ministries, and that fit with my gifts and my calling. So I thought, oh, this is going to be fun. Well, I don't know if you've ever led a team of women that have very strong opinions. And that's the way this team was. And there was one woman on the team where I would come up with a new idea, and I felt like she was constantly pushing back, constantly. And I finally went to a friend who was on the team who was a vice president for Kodak. And I said to her, I need feedback because I don't know what to do about this. And I never forgot that conversation. She said, Becky, you are forgetting that that woman on your team is an external processor. She doesn't know what she thinks, so she's trying to process it all out loud. She's not against you. And when she processes, you get a little defensive, and it makes you look insecure. Those words are not easy to hear, but she was dead bang on correct. You see, if we get defensive in a meeting, we do look insecure. We look like we're not sure of ourselves, and we're probably not. But people all process differently. Asking for feedback can be one of the greatest gifts you give yourself. So I dare you, I dare you to ask your spouse if you're married, how do you experience me as a listener? I dare you to ask your kids if you have them, how do you feel I listen to you? And I dare you to ask some of your coworkers, how did I come across in that meeting? Was I defensive? Was I talking too much? You know, somehow we've adopted the myth that to be a strong leader, you have to be a good talker. I would like to propose that to be a strong leader, you have to be a good listener. So ask for feedback. The third principle. is to slow down. 
Now, I got to tell you, this one hits me. You know, I, I often joke that when my husband got married, frantic meant frazzled, and the kids were combustible because we do everything at 90 miles an hour. I remember we had an executive assistant who worked for both of us, and at one point she said, I can't keep up with both of you. You exhaust me. And I, I took that to heart because we are a hurried culture. I remember when my husband, in the early 90s, went to meet with Dr. Leighton Ford. Steve had stepped into a large church. Again, we were very young. And he was afraid that his spiritual life was going to suffer. So he sat down with Leighton Ford. And he said, what is the key to my growing spiritually? And Leighton's answer shocked Steve. Leighton said, ruthlessly eliminate hurry. Originally, that phrase came from Dallas Willard. If you want to grow your spiritual life, ruthlessly eliminate hurry. But if you want to grow your relationships, ruthlessly eliminate hurry. Because you see, when you're constantly in a rush to get to the next meeting, people are not going to feel heard. Kim Scott, in her book, Radical Candor, tells a story of arriving at the office, knowing she had an upcoming meeting. And she stopped, and the first person she talked to poured out his heart about how he might need a kidney transplant. The second person whose desk she stopped at said that they had a child who was in the ICU, and they were terrified. The third person who flagged her down to talk wanted to tell her how their kid had scored on the math standardized tests. Kim Scott arrived at her desk and thought, what am I doing? When am I getting to the real work? Later that afternoon, she met with her leadership coach. And her leadership coach said to her, this is the job of leadership. This is your job, not the next meeting you have. Now, I realize we all have meetings, and we have to arrive there on time. What I would like to suggest to you is that you create some buffer between your meetings so that when you're walking down the halls and a colleague sees you, you have time to stop and listen to them. Several years ago, when I did my John Maxwell training, John talked from the stage about how we were all supposed to walk slowly through the room. And in my heart, I was a little skeptical. I remember thinking, I wonder if John walks slowly through a room. You know, he's a big guy, well known. The next morning, I had left the first session to go to the restroom, and I was heading back into the ballroom for the second session where John was to be the speaker. Minutes before he, or minutes, in a few minutes, he was to get up on the stage. He was walking with his event planner. And as I was walking back, John stopped and he said, What's your name? And I told him my name. And then he put his arm around my shoulder and he said, how are you enjoying the event? And I said, it's fantastic. And he went on and on with me. And I thought, this guy has to be on the stage in two minutes. But he took the time. See, John wants everybody to know, you know, his famous line is, I'm John Maxwell and I'm your friend. And, but he practiced what he preached, walk slowly through the room. Here's the thing. When you slow down, you are able to offer your unanxious leadership to your team. When you're walking fast, the signal that you're giving to everybody around you is you're anxious, you're uptight. And that's not something we want to pass on to our teams. I don't know if you've ever worked for a highly anxious leader. I have. But anxious leaders, 
it spills down to their team. And before you know it, everybody's feeling anxious. When you slow down, you're able to engage with people and they feel more connected. When you slow down, you're able to listen and look for clues as to how people are feeling. I, um, Marshanda said I can use this illustration. I met Marshanda, I, I guess about a month ago while we were talking about this event. And we were talking about listening. And she said, I can tell when someone doesn't feel heard on my team. And I said, how? She said, they talk faster. And I was like, that really struck me because Marshanda is illustrating what I'm talking about. She's looking and listening for clues. Does your team feel heard? David Augsburger wrote one of the most profound comments I've ever read. He said, for a person to feel heard is so closely linked to them feeling loved that the two are inseparable. In other words, the people on your team aren't going to feel cared for unless they feel heard by you. So slow down. Put in a buffer zone. Listen, I, I know the place of hurry. Uh, between 2016 and 2020, my husband and I traveled to 65 countries. It was a little crazy. And what I discovered about myself is I became addicted to the adrenaline rush. You know, it was, I, it was like I couldn't function and be creative unless I was rushing to catch the next plane. That's not the way we're supposed to live. Have you ever noticed that Jesus was never in a hurry? He never turned to the disciple and said, will you guys get your sandals on? We're running late for the next meeting. He took his time. We follow a leader who was not hurried. And we ourselves need to adopt his rhythm. The fourth principle is learn how to empathize. As leaders, and I'm putting myself in here with you, I don't want you to feel attacked in any way. As leaders, we tend to be fixers, don't we? I remember walking up the mountain with my husband years ago, and um, he was dealing with a really large church and a really divided staff. And he was frustrated, and he was anxious, and he was wondering if he wanted to resign. And as we walked up to that mountain, he began talking. And I knew what he had to do to fix it brilliant person that I am. I'm being facetious. And so I started to tell him, well, why don't you do this or that? He stopped and he turned to me and he said, you know, Becky, when I pour out my heart to you, I want you to listen. I don't want you to try to give me suggestions or advice or to fix it for me. I want you to hear my heart, and my feelings. Steve and I have both had to work on that. I'm guessing if you're married in the room, you've had to work on that with your spouse. You know, because our good intentions get in the way. We want to alleviate this other person's pain. But here's the thing. Most people can solve their own problems. And if you try to solve it for them, you make them look like an idiot. And nobody wants to feel like an idiot. As leaders, instead of fixing, empathize. What do I mean? When you empathize, you are telling the other person, your feelings make sense to me. You know, our brains are so interesting. They are wired with mirror neurons. You probably know that. So if I'm in a room with you and you're empathizing with what I'm feeling, my little Neurons are going off, and so are yours. And there's this connection. People feel valued and loved when you empathize with them. 
we've got to learn how to bring this into the office. I wonder how many of you have teenagers in the home? Any of you? Oh, a lot of you do. How many of you have adult children? Okay, a lot of you. You know, there's a shift when your kids become teens. They don't want a lot of advice, and I get that. I mean, I get that it's hard for you because you want to steer them in the right direction. But people won't even receive your advice unless they feel connected to you. So do you remember what it was like to be a teen? Do you remember what it was like when you were first out of the home as an adult? Empathize with them. Use phrases like, wow, that must feel frustrating. Or I can see that you're really angry. Tell me about that. Or use other phrases. Here are some tips to effectively empathize. The first one is to silence your inner fixer. Oftentimes, as leaders, we love to give advice, you know, because we're leaders. So we think the whole world is just waiting for my advice. Silence your inner fixer. The second one is embrace your limitations. You are human. Most problems are extremely complicated. Most problems can't be fixed with an equation. Have you noticed this? Most problems are perhaps difficult, complicated, gray, and not black and white. So silence that part of yourself and embrace your limitations. Understand you are limited in your humanness. The third point, and I'm going to go back to this because it's so important, is learn the power of asking questions when somebody's pouring out their heart to you. You could say things like, how did that make you feel? Or what happened then? Or where do you think you should go from here? Or what do you want from me? How can I help? Learning the power of questions, especially questions that are open-ended, that don't have a yes or no answer, are a huge way to empathize with somebody. The next point under empathizing effectively is to validate feelings. I know some of you grew up at a time in history where, you know, we didn't talk about feelings a lot, especially not in the workplace. You know, and maybe you grew up in a religious system where God was painted as a God that didn't have feelings. Nothing could be farther from the truth, actually. And we need to validate feelings in people. You know, let's say you arrive at a team meeting and you notice that one of your team members is completely frazzled. A good place to start might be, hey, are you overwhelmed? And hopefully that person will be honest with you. And then you can say to them, it makes sense to me why you feel overwhelmed. I understand that feeling. Or maybe somebody's angry and you meet them for coffee in the beautiful coffee area that you have. And you notice that they're blowing off a lot of steam. You know, pause for a minute and say, you know, I can really understand why that would make you feel frustrated or angry. I remember trying to teach this principle to my little grandson. Um, his sister had scribbled all over his art project, and he was very upset. And so he shoved his chair over, and he told her in no uncertain terms to get away from his stuff. And um, his mama went to deal with the little sister and I sat down in front of Noah, and I got down on my knees, and I said, hey, buddy, do you feel frustrated? And he paused for a minute, and I said, frustrated means you're, you're angry because your sister wrecked your art project. And he said, yes. And I said, the next time she does that, why don't you say, I feel frustrated? So I wasn't sure if he got this lesson. A few hours later, he had a friend over who also had a little sister. 
and the boys were building a train track. And the sisters got into it and messed it up. And they both, both little boys came out dancing in the family room saying, we feel frustrated. <laughs> and I, I loved it because I gave him verbiage by connecting with him. I empathized with him. Let's face it, it is frustrating when somebody wrecks your project. It is frustrating when you arrive at work and things aren't done on time. It is frustrating when your team doesn't get the vision where you're going. But validating feelings. Now, you can't always validate actions. You know, when, when people are disruptive in a meeting, when they're blowing up, that's a time to take the person aside and have them share their feelings with you. But you can validate their feelings. The last um, principle that I have for effectively empathizing is to do frequent check-ins with your team. How are you feeling about this project? Where are you at? How are you feeling on our team? Notice, I keep using that word feeling because unless they can express their feelings to you about where they're at with different things, you're not going to get the best work from them because people need to feel valued and heard in the workplace in order to do their best work for you. And I think we all want our teams to feel valued and heard. The last principle that I have for you is to stay curious in conflict. And even when you're criticized, man, this was a growth point for me. I, by nature, had a sensitive spirit, still probably have a sensitive spirit, and I just am not a big fan of conflict. You know, uh, my husband calls them a rumble, you know, and he says, you know, we'll, we'll have a good rumble today at work. And that just sounds awful to me. I would rather everybody be happy, you know? And I have had to grow in my leadership because conflict is inevitable. But rather than being intimidated by it, you can switch your thinking so that you begin to realize that conflict can be transformational for your team. But it takes a shift in your thinking. It, and so when somebody on your team begins to criticize or you know, upend the whole meeting because they're upset. The first thing that I suggest is to pause. Pause, don't say anything back right away. Get a grip on your own emotions. Because a lot of times, people are not attacking you personally. They may have had a really rough morning. They may have had a fight with their spouse. They may have just gotten a bill that they have no idea how they're gonna pay. So pause for a minute. Don't respond right away. Sometimes people need to dump. Do you know what I mean by dump? They're just going to spew. And here's what I've learned. When people are really emotional and feel passionate about something and they're dumping, they can't receive what you say anyway. So you know what you're supposed to do? You just pause and you say, tell me more. Tell me more. Help me understand what's going on in your heart. I remember when one of our teens um, was really upset and uh, she had a lot going on and she seemed like she was really upset with me, you know, which probably was true to some extent. And as she was explaining all this, I kept saying, but I this, but I that. And it wasn't going anywhere. She was just getting more and more frustrated. She was having a complete and colossal meltdown. Finally, my husband knocked on her bedroom door and said, hey, can I come in and take over? I was like, have at it. I'm done. And you know, Steve, pulled that 16-year-old on his lap, and he said, tell me what's really going on. Well, it turns out 
the problem had nothing to do with me. It was pressure at school. It was pressure in her AP course. It was pressure to get this project done. And Steve just kept saying, tell me more. I think about the times in meetings. I don't know if you've ever been in a board meeting um, or a church business meeting where somebody blows sky high. I don't know if any of you experienced that. Um, I have. And it's uncomfortable for everybody. But the person who is dumping needs somebody to say, tell us more. There needs to be a pause. You need to let them finish dumping because they can't receive anything you say until their brain switches sides. Isn't that interesting? I mean, when you're in an emotional state, you cannot receive logic. Have you ever tried to be logical with a two-year-old? It doesn't work because their brain can't do that. So, but it's the same with adults. They cannot process when they're in an emotional place. The other thing when you're in conflict or when being criticized is you need to manage the story in your head. That is a hard one, isn't it? Because we all create stories. You know, I, I remember the first time I was criticized where somebody wrote me an email, they heard me on the radio, and they vehemently disagreed with something I said on the radio. And they wrote me a scathing email. And I remember being devastated and thinking, I quit. I'm not going to do this anymore. And, and, and then my mind went to all the what ifs. You know, what if there are more people like this that feel this way? What if, you know, this person hates me? She's going to start a smear campaign against me, all just because she doesn't agree with me on one thing. And I remember really freaking out about it. And I had to step back and say, I need to manage what goes on in my mind. Because you have sole control over your mind. And sometimes, as leaders, we need a self-management meeting, right? That's where you sit down with yourself and you say, why is this affecting me so much? What's at the root of this? Why am I reacting so strongly? Why is this criticism bothering me so much? I mean, you're all leaders, and you know that criticism comes with the gig, right? I mean, you are going to be criticized. And I don't like it any better than you do. But we've got to manage what's going on in our minds. We are the only created being that can actually direct our thoughts. And I find that intriguing. So when people are criticizing you, take a breather, take a break, and do a little self-analysis. You know, ask yourself, why is this so important to me? Why am I feeling this? Is there a trigger in here? Is it triggering something from my childhood? And then ask, what does God want me to see in this? Find the truth in it. A lot of times, we're quick to write off anybody that criticizes us. But often, there's a tiny bit of truth in what they're saying. And in order to be a mature adult leader, you need to be able to look at the truth in the situation and what they're criticizing you for. So take some time to do that. Because the bottom line is, criticism and conflict will not go away anytime soon. Here are some tips to help you do that. Shift your focus from defending yourself and proving your point to understanding the other person. You know, let's say you're in an argument with a team member, and that team member feels very differently than you do about an upcoming project. Rather than thinking ahead while they're talking, how can I defend this better so that they get on board with me, which is something we all do, stop. Shift your focus to that person and understanding their perspective. You don't have to agree with their perspective. You know, we are mature adults. We can disagree and yet move towards a common goal. 
So shift your focus to really understanding that person's perspective because they may have a perspective that you haven't thought of yet. As I said before, look for a piece of truth in the criticism. It's so hard to do. I get it. You know, when somebody's criticizing you, it takes a lot to say, you know what? You're right about this. You're right about this. I did come across that way. Or I did say that flippantly and I shouldn't have. You know, these principles are not only going to help you in your work relationships, they're going to help you in your personal relationships. And then work hard at letting go of defensiveness. I, you know, our human nature is so defensive, right? I mean, am I the only one in the room that struggles with this? You know, somebody criticizes you and you're thinking, well, I didn't do that. I didn't do this. I didn't mean to come across that way. And we launch into defensiveness. But that's not helping solve the conflict. Shift your focus to understanding them and pause for a moment and pray, Lord, help me to let go of defensiveness in this argument. Help me to be able to fully see this other person that's in front of me. My husband, Steve, was traveling in Australia about five years ago. And he had finished his meetings. And he grabbed a taxi cab to get to the airport. And he noticed that the taxi cab driver was likely Muslim in faith. And my husband was just dying to engage with him. Um, he has a deep heart for the Middle East, and this gentleman was from Somalia. So Steve knew right away his leanings as far as religion. And so Steve started asking him some questions about how long he had been driving the taxi and about his family and about his faith. And, you know, the taxi cab driver said, well, you know, I'm really not that great of a Muslim because I haven't done the Hajj yet. And, you know, they were talking and talking and talking. And Steve noticed that they were approaching the airport. And he posed this question to the taxi cab driver. He said, hey, what advice would you give me to relate better to Muslims? And there was a long pause from the taxi cab driver. And the taxi cab driver said these words. He said, you Christians don't listen. You want to tell us what to think. And you don't take time to understand us. Wow, what an indictment. See, you and I claim to follow Jesus. Jesus was the greatest listener that ever walked the face of the earth. In order to follow him, we've got to learn to listen. The same indictment, unfortunately, could be made of leaders. I, in getting ready for this, I talked to several people from different organizations. And they said things to me like, Leaders come into the room with an agenda. They're not interested in what I have to say. Leaders are the worst at listening. They're in a hurry. I'm talking to them, and they're looking over my shoulder. Leaders aren't hearing my feelings. That's a rough indictment for us. Because you see, the thing is, if you want your influence to grow, and more importantly, if you want your relationships to grow, you've got to learn how to really be an effective listener. Theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, Christians have forgotten the ministry of listening that has been committed to them by him who's himself, who is the great listener, and whose work they should share. We should listen with the ears of God that we may speak the word of God. I want to leave you with that quote as I end this part of the training because I do think there's truth in that. 
We live in one of the most polarized times in history that I remember. You cannot speak truth to people unless you're listening to them. And so if you're going to lead your teams well, I want you to remember these five principles. Prioritize connection over direction. Don't just be directing people. Seek to connect with them first. Ask for feedback, I dare you. And then when somebody gives you feedback without being defensive, say thank you for sharing that with me. Slow down. Slow down so that you have time to talk to people who are in the halls. Slow down. And then, I'm trying to remember what my fourth point is here. S slow down and then learn how to empathize. The great connector is empathizing. Your feelings make sense to me. And then finally, learn how to handle conflict. Seek to understand in conflict and when you're criticized. I am going to give my voice a little bit of a break now. And I have a heart for competition. Our kids have all been raised with a healthy sense of competition. You know, we've had gingerbread house competitions. We've had who can hold their breath under the water the longest. We've had all kinds of crazy competitions in our family. And so we're going to do a little competition here between the tables. There is a pad of paper on your table. You need to appoint someone to be the scribe for your table. And I'm going to give you a few minutes, and I want you to come up with 25 questions that are not yes or no answers. And the first table to have this completed is going to stand to their feet. Okay, does every table have a scribe? Are you ready? Okay, go. What's your birthday? How did that make you feel? Could you tell me more? Uh, what is the way to move forward? How did you get involved? How did you, I know somebody's counting these two. How did you arrive at that conclusion? What's the path forward? How did you reach that decision? What can we do? What were you thinking? <laughs> How could I improve my communication? What did you think we should do? What did you, sorry, this is in my writing. Uh, when did you start thinking this? When did you conclude that? Uh, um, come up with that conclusion, what, I apologize, I'm going to have to skip that one, I can't read that, how do you uh, explain, yeah, I know, uh, how do you explain your views, what would Jesus do, how does, uh, how would Jesus behave, um, like I said, I did not know I was going to be reading these, um, what does the Bible say about that? Uh, when are you available available to talk more? Um, how are you? How is your day? What are your expectations? How can I help with this? Andrew uh, Armstrong counted these, so uh, I'm, Good I'm job. a Marine, so yeah. <laughs> Okay, what are some other questions you can ask? What did some of you come up with that aren't on that list? Don't be shy, come up to the mic. What about where did you go on vacation last year? What do you like about that spot? What's the favorite country you've ever traveled to? Just drawing them out. These questions are huge. You know, I've gotten to the point where before I meet somebody for coffee or lunch, I think through the last time I was with that person, and I come up with three questions 
that I'm going to be able to ask them. You know, how is this going in your life? The last time we were together, you mentioned this or that. Because, again, it's about that connection. Any other questions? I know some of you have other questions that were on that list. Pardon? I love that. What was the high point of your day and what was the low point of your day? We asked that question at the dinner table at night. Um, my husband and I still ask each other that. <laughs> you know, what's another question? Do, uh, do you feel like I'm listening? Do you feel like I'm listening? And should I shut my iPad and <laughs> that is huge. Okay, now. I want you to share around your tables. I mentioned that it was brought to my attention um, that somebody doesn't feel heard, and when they don't feel heard, they talk fast. I want you on your tables to make another list of the clues that you see on your team when someone is not feeling heard. Can you do that? You don't have to come up with 25. Just come up with a few, and then you're going to take turns coming up to the mic because this will benefit the entire group. Okay, are you ready to share some of what you have observed on your different teams when somebody does not feel listened to? Come on up to the mic. Just some of them uh, just shut down. Defensiveness, mm. change subject, mm -hmm. no eye contact, body language changes, you know, you're crossing the arms, so yes. things that are pretty obvious. Some may raise their voice and just say, you're not listening and just be right in your face. Um, putting others down, they may deflect and start saying, well, you know, Miranda did this or someone else did that. Yeah, and, that's good. And just deflecting away from them. Now with electronic devices, I, I'm just going to pick up my phone and I'm going to start looking at that. And just, those are just some of the things that we, uh, we shared. That's really good. You know, um, yeah, let's clap for that. That was really good. The whole electronic devices is a new, a newer problem in the workplace, isn't it? You know? Anybody else have other signs that you notice when your team does not feel heard? <laughs> Thank you. I want her to feel heard. Um, yes. When, <laughs> uh, when people say, never mind, or sure, or what was the other one? Um, never mind. Sh fine. fine. That's yes. a big one. Yes. Yeah. That is so good. Are you, I hope you're writing some of these down because that's going to help you and it will be a, a signal to you. Okay. This person is not feeling heard. What else do you have? So one of the things we talked about was if uh, you're trying to facilitate a group conversation and maybe it goes long or something, somebody will follow you back to your desk or send you an email later and say, I didn't feel comfortable saying this in the meeting or I didn't get a chance to or this is what I said and here's what I really was trying to say. So that if they don't feel like they can express that in a group, sometimes you'll get like the, the side conversation. Yeah, that's really good. What do we do when people don't feel like they can share their opinions in a team meeting? So he's not in this room, but many of you know John McKeever, who will definitely let you know with physical taps to get your attention. Yes. Are you paying like, just that kind of thing, or recap for me, or tell me what. Yes. What did I was? What was I just saying? We brought that up as a personal bruised experience. <laughs> Somebody over here had their hand raised. Come on up to the mic. Some sometimes, if you have quiet people on your team, you just have to come out and ask them outright, what do you have to say about this, or what do you think about yes. this? Yes, yes. You know, the more you listen as a leader, the safer your team is going to feel 
to share their opinions. You know, the more you know your team, you're going to pick up more of the signals that they're not feeling heard. I want to tell you about my grandson, Josh. So Josh is 11 years old. And he gathered his cousins to start a business in my basement. It's called Fly High. Now, I know we live in Colorado. That's not where this is going. <laughs> it's a paper airplane business. And um, so what they do is at Sunday dinner when we're all together, they sell, you know, they design these paper airplanes. And we all go down and we all buy these paper airplanes. And since that time, they've added the Fly High Cafe, which basically means they go to my pantry, steal food, and then sell it back to us. <laughs> anyway, Josh is quite the leader. So he knows his team pretty well. He knows, for example, that Ty loves the Broncos. So he'll say, you work the front desk when there's a Broncos game on. And he turns the front desk towards the Broncos. And then he knows that Kinley loves to pretend that she's making food. So he'll have her be over the cafe. And then he knows that my little grandson, Caden, is very detail-oriented. So he's like, Caden, you're in charge of IT. And so, I mean, I have a budding CEO in my family. But what I love about that is he knows his team. He knows each person, their strengths and their weaknesses. And if we're going to know our teams, we've got to listen to them. So as we finish our time together, do you have any questions? I might or I might not have the answers to those. But if you do, come up to the mics. I was just thinking, is this on? OK, I can't hear myself. I was just thinking about your, your uh, mention about tra traveling 65 countries and getting to some place and coming in, and, and you had a hard time being creative. Um, maybe, maybe an understanding or a story of uh, when you've been running 100 miles an hour and realized you had to get off and be in a listening mode and how you did that without you know, coming, coming in glued. That is an excellent question. And I, before I share a story, I will tell you I did not do this well. <laughs> we had been in Ecuador speaking. Um, and then we were supposed to fly through Brazil. But we didn't realize we needed visas because we were going to start a conference in South Africa. And so we're in the Ecuador airport. And um, my husband, bless his heart, he's arguing with the, the person in charge of the airlines, saying, no, you can get us in there. I know you can. You know, you can get us through Brazil, because it's going to take time off of our, our trip to make it to South Africa. They said, well, I'm sorry, sir, we cannot do that. So we had to fly from Ecuador to Miami, from Miami over to Germany, from Germany down to South Africa. And when we got there, I was supposed to speak first. And we had gone to see a whole shelter for little girls who had been abused. And I was exhausted. We'd had two red-eye flights back to back. And I don't sleep on planes. And I just remember getting there. And I, I said to Steve, I've got nothing. You're on first. I can't. I, I don't even know my name at this moment because I was so tired. Interestingly enough, during COVID, I felt a strong impression in my soul that I needed to reorder my life and slow down so that I could be the listener I wanted to be. Because on that trip, I didn't listen well to people. I, I just felt like my brain was shutting down. Somebody said about people not feeling heard, their brain shuts down. That's what happens to me when I get exhausted and I'm running, 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 running. And so my brain shut down, and I didn't listen well there. But I think it's a, it was a good corrective for me. Because again, we have to embrace our limits. And my limits do not allow me to fly two red-eye flights back to back and then show up and be on. Is there another question? Do you have any guidance for structuring like your listening sessions? Because sometimes you might want to 
take someone's feedback, but it's maybe not the proper venue or timing for that question or that feedback? Do, do you have any guidance on how to kind of order that and, and when a leader should invite appropriate questions? Yes. I, I've, um, I am a big proponent of reflective time and self-management time. And so I would say, after you leave a meeting, if you can help it, don't go right into the next meeting. Spend some time reflecting on what was said. You might not be able to address it in that moment, but write down your thoughts about that, you know, and think about it. And then do the check-in later. Hey, I noticed this came up in the meeting, or I noticed this came up in the meeting. Can we have a conversation about that? Because I really want you to feel heard, you know, and so... That self-reflective time is so important. And as leaders, a lot of times we don't take that time, right? Because we're on to the next meeting. 